Well, hey, welcome to First Church. So glad you guys are here, and happy Father's Day. We just want to let all of our dads in the room know how much we appreciate you. Thank you for setting such a godly example for your kids and for being present in their lives. We also want to let you know that we're praying for you dads every single day. So we appreciate what you're doing, and we're so grateful that you're here. And I want to say hello to the dads on the other side of the camera. We've got family out of Stone Canyon, as well as others who will join us later online. So if you would, put your hands together and welcome those who are tuning into our service. And since it is Father's Day, I know that some dads, at least at times, feel unappreciated. And so if you've ever felt disrespected or unappreciated, uh, I found a video for you. It's of this dad who decided to get the best of his teenage daughter. See, she always would ignore him when he would drop her off for school in their carpool. He would say goodbye or love you or have a good day, and she would just ignore him. She was too cool to respond. And so one day, he had had enough, and... I think he won out. So take a look at what took place. Bye, sweet girl. Have a good day at school. Oh, Bye, sweet girl. Bye, Kate. Bye, Kate. Get out. Get out. I love you, Kate. Stay out. Have a great day at school, Kate. Bye, Cordelia. Bye, Emma. Oh. I love you, Kate. Oh, I'm Kate Downey's father. Hi, Principal Dennis. Hi, Principal Dennis. I'm Kate Downey's father, and I love her. I'm going to miss her all day. I love you, Kate. I bet you that embarrassed her for sure. Let me just ask, have you guys ever been in a situation before when somebody intentionally tried to make you feel uncomfortable? I think probably we all have. And the subject that I'm going to introduce today as we begin this new series is one that makes some people feel a little uncomfortable, especially in church. Now, it's not my intention to make anybody feel uncomfortable, but I know it's going to happen. Because I've been in ministry long enough to know anytime this subject comes up, some people get nervous, some people tune out, some people skip the next service, I mean the next Sunday because they don't want to come back and hear the next sermon in the series. I know this is an uncomfortable subject, but I believe it's one that we need to talk about. I don't necessarily like talking about it, but if I'm going to preach what Jesus preached, if I'm going to teach what he taught, then I've got to talk about this subject because he talked about it a lot. You guys probably know what the subject is, what the topic is, especially if you looked at the bulletin this morning and saw our sermon series graphic, Fool's Gold. Today, we're going to be talking about the subject of money. Yeah, I know. I want to make it a little bit dramatic there. Okay, we're going to talk about money. And I get it. Money is a subject that people don't like to hear about in church, and I think there are some legitimate reasons for that. But we're going to try to do it in a healthy way because I know there are different reactions to the word money. It's one of those words that when people hear it, they respond in different ways, especially in a church setting. You guys remember a, about a year, year and a half ago or so, the Internet blew up. I mean, just lost its mind because of a controversy over one word. There was a recording of this word, and people... People debated back and forth whether the word was Laurel or Yanny. You guys remember this online throughout social media? There are a lot of polls that were taken to see what this word really, what the person saying the word is trying to say. And if, in case you didn't catch this or you missed this, here's the recording of the word. Let me see what you guys hear. Go ahead and play it. Laurel. 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 Now, some people believe that the voice is saying Yanny. Some people believe the voice is saying Laurel. So I'm going to play it one more time, and then I'll take a quick poll to see where you guys are. Okay, so listen to it again. Here we go. Laurel. 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 Okay, so I want you to shout out and let me know what team you're on. Team Yanny or Team Laurel, okay? So shout out. Let me hear you. Be loud so I can hear you. I want to see where you guys are. How many guys believe that the voice was saying Yanny? All right, good number of you. How many guys are Christians and you're on Team Laurel, okay? How many guys are Team Laurel? All right, yeah, it's about even, and that makes sense because they've actually done studies on this recording, and according to these studies, 47% of people hear Yanny, they're crazy, but they hear Yanny, and 53% 
hear laurel. And so it's about divided. The actual original word was laurel. That's what it was intended to be. But like I said, almost half of people hear the word yanny. One word, two very different responses. And you know, there are a number of words or phrases or descriptions out there that bring about different responses. You know, if I were to uh, basically say a certain genre of music some of you guys would get excited and cheer uh, other of you would think oh that's you know that's a terrible genre of music I hate that if I were to give a politician's name right now some of you guys would cheer and hoop and holler yeah that's our guy or that's our gal other of you would boo and say I'll never vote for that person you know if I were to maybe even say a sports team some of you guys would hoop and holler other of you guys would boo I get it there are certain words certain descriptions certain names that just bring about various responses and I believe money is one of those terms like I said especially when it's used in church and in my time in ministry I've heard some different reactions to this word money one reaction that I've heard before and you've probably heard this too people will say all the church is ever interested in is my money I've heard this over and over again anytime a preacher stands up on a stage and talks about money it's all the church ever talks about it's all they're interested in is my money guys I've got some family members that have said this to me I remember last Thanksgiving I was home and I was riding in a car with one of my family members and this family member went on a rant about how all the church ever does is ask for money and maybe that's true in some churches that's not the case here you guys know that but I get it why some people are cynical when the topic of money comes up in church with all the hypocrisy that has gone on in some churches all the scandals that we've seen on TV about televangelists swindling people out of money or maybe church treasures misusing money or whatever I get it I understand why some people are cynical when they hear the subject of money come up in church and honestly I just want to let you know my heart I'm embarrassed by all that stuff too I hate it I hate it that people use the name of God for their own selfish means. I hate that, that they abuse the name of God in order to get rich quick. I hate that. And that's not me, and that's not our church. I think we need to have an honest conversation about where our church is on this subject because we're not those churches. We're not that type of ministry that's just trying to swindle money out of people. See, First Church isn't a church that's all about money. We're a church that's all about ministry. And there's a huge difference there. So let's have an honest conversation about who we are as a church. Because if we are being honest and transparent, there is a large number, number of people who attend services every single weekend here at First Church who never give a dime to our church, who never give anything to our church. They just show up. And you know what? We don't send bill collectors after them. We don't send them a bill in the mail that says, hey, uh, you need to pay up for the early childhood ministry that you use or the children's programming that your kids were a part of or the student ministry that your kids were a part of. We don't send them a bill that says, hey, it took resources to put on that Sunday service you were a part of, so pay up. We don't do that. Our doors are wide open to everybody. We don't shut the doors, lock the doors to anyone. What we offer here week in and week out is absolutely free. It is open to anyone, whether you pay anything or not. Now, try that out today when you go out to eat. It's Father's Day, right? So if you take your dad out to eat for lunch, try to go to a restaurant and consume their food, eat their food, and then walk out and not pay. You're probably going to get stopped, and you may even get your picture up on a Owasso-isms. You know what I'm talking about? You're going to get in trouble for doing that, so don't do that. If you haven't bought your dad a Father's Day gift yet, if you go to Walmart or someplace and you buy him a gift, don't walk out and not pay, because if you get caught, you're going to get in trouble, right? Don't do that. We wouldn't think of doing that in those contexts, hopefully, <laughs> but that's because businesses, they're all about money. Church, we're not. We're all about ministry. And there is a huge difference. And as a leadership here at First Church, we want you to know what we're all about. We believe one of the primary reasons why we exist, why we're here, is to give ourselves away. That's why over the past year, from last June to this June, we are on target to give away a quarter of a million dollars to different needs throughout our community and across the globe. Ministry needs, chari charitable needs, kingdom needs. We are on track to give away a quarter of a million dollars. And I think that's something to get excited about because we are here. Yeah, applaud for that. We believe we're here to give ourselves away. 
And that's why it was said just a little bit earlier in this service, over the past two weeks through a dollar drive, we have collected almost $7,000. And we'll probably have more come in this Sunday. But we've collected almost $7,000 just to give away to flood and storm victims throughout northeast Oklahoma. We believe we're here to unleash God's love. And so we do that by giving ourselves away. And I'm not sure how other churches and other ministries function. I'm not sure how the churches you used to be a part of function. But at First Church, we're not all about money. We are all about ministry. Now, there's another reaction that I hear whenever I talk about money in church, and that next reaction is when people say, you know, the church needs to talk about money. And these are coming from people who are supporting what we're trying to do here, and there's a reason why they're supporting it. Let me just see by a show of hands at all of our campuses, how many of you guys have ever made a financial mistake in the past? Anybody ever made a financial mistake? Okay, I think just about all of us. We all have, right? And there are people who are sitting in this service right now who at one time in their lives, they were living outside of God's plan for their resources, for their money, for their finances. And because they were living outside of God's plan, their lives were a wreck. Not just their financial lives, but their lives in general were a wreck. And then they found God's plan for their resources, God's plan for their finances. And they started to do it His way, and they found that plan in this book. I'm not sure if you've heard about it. It's called the Bible. They found His plan in this book, and they all followed it, and now... God is blessing their lives. Now, we don't preach a health and wealth gospel. I'm not saying that if you follow God's plan for your finances, that all of a sudden you're going to be independently wealthy or something like that. You get everything that you ever dreamed of or want. I'm not saying that. But when you do follow God's plan, when you align your resource, resources with His priorities, He will bring about stability and peace in your life like you don't have right now. And there are people sitting in this service right now who have experienced that peace. And at one time, they didn't have it. They're experiencing that stability now. And at one time, they didn't have it. And they are praying right now for you guys who aren't experiencing it because they know the importance of following God's plan and especially following God's plan when it comes to their finances. And so they're saying, yes, preach on that. This is what our culture needs to hear. This is what so many people in our church needs to hear. But then there's a third reaction that I've often heard, and it comes in the form of a question, and it's this, will this really help me? Because I know every time a church starts to talk about money, there are those who sit up in their seats, their ears perk up, and they're wondering, will this practically help me? Because they know something isn't right in their lives, and they have a suspicion it's because their finances aren't right. And if that's you, maybe you're somebody right now who's living comfortably, but things just don't feel right because you know your priorities aren't right. Maybe you're somebody who's barely holding your head above water right now and you want help, but you don't know where to turn. Maybe you're someone who wants to give God this area of your life, the financial area of your life, but you are afraid to do so. Well, let me just say, if that's you, take a deep breath right now because I'm not here to shame you. I'm not here to guilt you into giving more. I'm not here to condemn you or anything like that. I am simply here to be a friend and to come alongside you as a brother in Christ and so that together we can encourage one another to align our resources with God's priorities. Because the Bible teaches that seeking God's priorities first is the best way to live. Jesus says this in Matthew 6, verse 33. Seek first God's kingdom and what God wants. Then all your other needs will be met as well. In other words, when you align your life with God's priorities, He will take care of everything else. He will take care of the rest. And that's especially true when it comes to our money. When you align your resources with God's priorities, He will take care of your needs. He will provide for you. Now, again, I want to be clear. This doesn't mean that He's going to give you everything you want. It doesn't say He will give you all your wants. That's not what it says. It says He will take care of your needs. He will make sure that you are taken care of as His child. When you align your resources with His priorities, God will watch over you. He will be with you in a very powerful way because when we put Him first, it is always the best way to live. But here's the thing. Aligning our resources with God's priorities may be the best way to live, but it's not the normal way to live. Just look at our culture today. Now, I get it. From a very young age, most of us just wanted to be normal. You know why? Because we wanted to fit in. We want to feel accepted. 
We want to belong. And so normal has kind of been our goal. I mean, some of you guys have painful past memories of being labeled weird or odd or strange. Nobody wants that. And so we spend our lives thinking like normal people think, acting like normal people act, doing what normal people do, saying what normal people say. And the end result is we end up with what normal people end up with. And that's especially true when it comes to the area of money. So let me let you know what normal is in our culture today, our society today when it comes to money and finance. You know what normal is? Normal is living paycheck to paycheck. According to a recent study that was done, 60% of Americans live paycheck to paycheck, meaning if they missed one paycheck, they would be in serious trouble. They could not survive. You know what normal is in our culture? Normal is living beyond your means. Normal is being broke. Normal is maxing out your credit cards. Normal is heaping up mounds of debt. Normal is spending money you don't have in order to keep up with others. Normal is having families divided and fighting over finances. Normal is greed. Normal is selfishness. A recent report by the Federal Reserve stated that 40% of Americans could not come up with $400 for an emergency expense. If an emergency came up, they could not come up with $400 in order to meet that emergency. Another study stated that 25% of Americans are using credit cards for their basic daily living expenses. They're using credit cards to pay for their basic daily living expenses. And we've probably all heard that one of the leading causes of divorce and family dysfunction in our country today is money. So let's just be honest about it. What's considered normal isn't working. Normal isn't working. I have a friend who often says, if you want what normal people have financially, then do what normal people do. But if you want what a few people have financially, then do what a few people do. And I don't know if that statement is original to my friend, but I think it's true. And Jesus is going to make this very point in Luke chapter 12. So if you have your Bibles or Bible app on your phone or tablet, Luke chapter 12 is where we're going to be today. And Jesus is going to address the issue of what's considered normal when it comes to money in the culture that he lived in. But the thing is, our culture 2,000 years later is not that different. In fact, I think people are just the same (laughs) over and over again. Our circumstances change, but we oftentimes have the same mindset, the same attitude. And so what Jesus says about money 2,000 years ago definitely applies to our culture today as well. Now, Jesus is preaching to crowds and crowds of people. I mean, more and more people are flocking to him, even to the point that they're trampling over one another to get to him. And as Jesus is teaching these large crowds, somebody interrupts him. A man up front interrupts him. He says, teacher, I've got a question for you. Rabbi, I've got a uh, question for you. And you know what he asked Jesus? He says, hey, I've got this family dispute going on right now over finances. Can you settle our financial dispute? Now, I know that sounds odd and shocking to us because in our day and age, families never fight over money, right? I mean, that never happens. But in Jesus' day, they weren't as advanced as we... No, I'm kidding. We fight over it too, don't we? And so we've got 2,000 years ago, a family dispute over money, and this guy speaks up and he says, hey, teacher, would you settle this financial dispute my family's having? So Jesus responds to this man's request, and listen to how he responds, verse 15 of Luke chapter 12. Watch out. Be on your guard against all kinds of greed. A man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. So Jesus doesn't directly address the issue at hand, but instead he speaks in a more general uh, way to the entire audience, and he says, watch out. Now watch out, this was a military term that was used for somebody who was on lookout, lookout duty. So he says, watch out, and then he goes on to say, be on your guard. Another military phrase here. What is he trying to say here? What he's saying is, you need to be on the lookout and be on guard because if we're not alert, if we're not intentionally guarding our hearts, guarding our lives, we will just go with the flow and do what everyone else does when it comes to money. We will just go along with everybody else, and we will settle for what's considered normal when it comes to our finances, when it comes to our resources. And we will just go along with everybody else down the path of destruction. 
We would just go along with everybody else living a very unhealthy lifestyle. So we have to be intentional about making sure that we don't do what's normal, that we go against the flow. And Jesus talks about what's considered normal in his culture and it's also what's considered normal in our culture today. And he uses one word for that, and it's the word greed. And this Greek word for greed literally means an insatiable desire for more. In other words, what's considered normal when it comes to finances, when it comes to money, is getting as much as you possibly can. It's finding your identity in your stuff. And so you will have more meaning and satisfaction in life the more stuff you have, the more things you possess. That's what people consider to be normal. And Jesus says it's a lie. Jesus says that that's an unhealthy way to live. And that's why he goes on to say very clearly a man's life does not consist in the abundance of his possessions. In other words, there is more to life than just getting more and more things. There's more to life than just getting more and more stuff. But see, he lived in a culture, and we live in a culture that very much finds our identity in our stuff and what we have. And so Jesus here at the very beginning is going to expose one of the lies that so many people believe when it comes to money, and it's this. I am what I own. Now, he's going to expose other lies, but is this the first lie he exposes, that people believe I am what I own? Now, most people would never say that directly, I am what I own, but they live that way. They believe that their stuff defines them, that what they own, their bank account, gives them their identity. And Jesus is going to say this just isn't true. Now, Jesus is not saying that there's anything wrong with having stuff, having belongings, even having wealth for that matter. But when your satisfaction in life is connected to your net worth, you're missing out on what Jesus calls the abundant life. Let me put it this way. There's nothing wrong with having stuff as long as it's not at the expense of missing the purpose God has for your life. And I would say deep down, most of us know this. Most of us get this. But practically speaking, we don't always live that way. Let me ask you a few questions. I heard a preacher a while back ask these questions of his church, and I thought it'd be good to ask you guys as well because I think they wake us up to where we find our identity. So don't answer these out loud. Just keep track yourself. Answer them personally. And here's the first question. Do you ever buy things to impress others? Yes or no? Here's the next one. Do you ever become consumed with how others perceive something you own? Have you ever spent a ridiculous amount of money in order to have a certain brand label? Have you ever bought a house because you like the neighborhood more than you like the house? Have you ever been guilty of letting your spending habits determine your lifestyle rather than the commands of God? Have you ever worked into a conversation how well you're doing financially? Now, I didn't ask those questions in order to shame anybody or for you to feel any type of guilt. I asked those questions because they can be a wake-up call for us to discover where we find our identity. Because a lot of us, when we ask questions like that, we discover that we're trying to find our identity in our wallets rather than what's in our hearts. See, greed develops when you try to find your identity in your stuff in your wallet or in your purse rather than what's in your heart. And so Jesus is going to expose some more lies for us when it comes to money to make sure that we are living an atypical life, that we are living a life that goes against the flow. And the way that he is going to do that is to help us find our identity in him and not in our stuff. And he's going to tell a parable, which you've probably heard before, and it's found starting in verse 16 of Luke chapter 12, and we're going to read it in its entirety. And I believe this parable speaks volumes to our culture today. And I know it did back in his day as well, but it definitely speaks to what we're dealing with today. So listen to this parable, which is just an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. As Jesus wakes us up to some things and exposes some of the lies that we often believe when it comes to money and finances. Verse 16. And he told them this parable. The ground of a certain rich man produced a good crop. He thought to himself, what shall I do? I have no place to store my crops. Then he said, this is what I'll do. I will tear down my barns and build bigger ones. And there I will store all my grain and my goods. And I'll say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy, eat, drink, and be merry. 
But God said to him, you fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? This is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God. Now, let's be transparent here for a second. If we didn't know the end of the story, if we didn't know the conclusion that Jesus was trying to make, I wonder if we would think that this guy in the parable did anything wrong. Because look at what happens. Basically, this guy, he works hard, he gets a bunch of wealth, and then he decides to save up that wealth so that he can live a comfortable life. Isn't that the goal that a lot of people have? They want to work hard so they can save a bunch of money and live, a, and live a comfortable life. Is there anything really wrong with that? I mean, isn't that really the American dream? And he puts it like this in Luke 12, verse 19. And so I will say to myself, you have plenty of good things laid up for many years. Take life easy. Eat, drink, and be merry. I mean, this guy, he hasn't illegally obtained his wealth. He doesn't feel entitled. We don't get a hint that he has an entitlement mindset or anything like that. He's worked hard for what he has. He's earned it. Most people wouldn't see anything wrong with what he does in this parable. And yet Jesus, at the end of the parable, calls this man a fool. Why? Is Jesus criticizing his ambition? No. There's nothing wrong with having ambition. In fact, the Bible even tells us we need to have ambition. Doesn't Paul say, if you don't work, you don't eat? I mean, the Bible tells us we are to have ambition in life. No, there's nothing wrong with his ambition. What's wrong was this man's priorities. Notice that everything he does in this parable is for himself. Ten different times in just a couple of verses, he uses the first person pronouns, I, me, or mine. Ten different times. Did you catch that when we read it? He's all about himself. And here's the thing. He mentions himself over and over and over again, and there is absolutely no mention of God. He completely and totally leaves God out of the equation. And because of that, he gets into some trouble. What Jesus here is doing is he is exposing another lie that people often believe, and it's this. It's my money. That's lie number two. People believe it's my money. You've heard people say, my money is my money. It's my money. I had a friend over to the house this week, and we were talking on my back porch, and as we were talking, he used that phrase about something. He said, that's my money. And we've all used it. I've used it. You've used it. We've all said it. But is that true? Not at all. The Bible teaches the exact opposite. Psalm 24, verse 1. The earth is the Lord's and everything in it. See, the Bible repeatedly reminds me of this truth. I am not an owner of anything, but a manager of God's resources. And I believe God wants you to know that truth today as well. So if you would leave that up on the screen just for a second, and I want us at all of our campuses to say that out loud together on the count of three. So let's see if we can do that on the count of three. Just say that phrase out loud with me. One, two, three. I am not an owner of anything, but a manager of God's resources. Now, again, if you've been in church any time at all, you get that, you understand that, you know that when you die, you can't take anything with you. We get that in our heads. But we don't always live that way. And to a lot of people, that statement that we just read out loud, it seems kind of odd. It seems a little weird. I mean, it's not normal. Let me give you an example. My daughter, Addie, she's two years old, and the other day I went to McDonald's and got our family some food, went to the drive-thru, took it home. And so we got home, and my kids were just super excited because right now McDonald's, those of you who have little kids know this, the toys and their Happy Meals are Toy Story 4 toys. Now, my kids and Allison and me, we are pumped about the new Toy Story movie. We are excited about it coming out. In just a moment of honesty, we already have our tickets. We have advanced tickets to go to the first day showing of Toy Story 4. We are excited about this new Toy Story movie. We love the Toy Story series, and so my kids are pumped about it, and when we found out that they had Toy Story toys, I mean, we were just ecstatic, and so we got home, and the kids opened up their half meals to see which toy that they got, and so the first one that they got was the Bo Peep character, and I've got Addie's up here with me. If she knew that 
I had it, she would probably be pretty upset about it. But I snuck it out of the house this morning to show you guys. You guys know Bo Peep is a character in Toy Story. And so Addie and Alex were both looking at it, playing with it. And then I said, okay, guys, put the toys aside. Got to eat our food. And so they did. They actually listened. And so they started eating their Happy Meal food. And so I just reached over and picked up Addie's little Bo Peep because I wanted to look at it. I hadn't seen it yet. Maybe I wanted to get one for me. I don't know. So I picked it up and I looked at it. And as soon as I did, Addie got mad. I mean, she had this look on her face like she could kill me, and she said, Daddy, mine! And I looked at her kind of funny, and she said it again, Mine! Mine! Just over and over again. And I wanted to say, Now listen here, little girl. You didn't pay for this. You couldn't afford this. You don't have any money to buy a Happy Meal. I paid for this. I gave it to you, and I don't want it. I'm just going to hold it for a second. You can let me hold it while you eat your food, which, by the way, I also paid for. I wanted to tell her that. Of course, she's two years old. She wouldn't have understood any of that. But I was like, come on here. What do you mean mine? And here's the thing. No one taught my two-year-old daughter to say the word mine. At no point... As Allison and I are teaching her things, do we ever set Addie down and say, okay, now, Addie, there's this word that we want you to learn. It's the word mine, so say it with us now. Here we go. Mine. Come on, say it with us, Addie. Mine. We never did that. She just picked it up on her own. We try to teach her other words, and she can't get it. But mine, she's got down. And you guys who have raised kids, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Nobody teaches a little kid the word mine. We just pick up on it, right? Because our society, our culture teaches us the way that we're wired is, hey, what I have in my hands, it's mine. And yet the Bible says that that's a lie, that it's not true at all. Contrary to what we might think and believe, nothing is really ours. We come into this world with nothing, and we can't take any of it with us. And that's why at the end of this parable, Jesus says that God speaks to this rich fool in verse 20, and he says, You fool, this very night your life will be demanded from you. Then who will get what you have prepared for yourself? In other words, all this stuff you have, it's not really yours. And you've put all your stock in it. You've invested in all this temporary stuff and you can't take any of it with you. Because you've been selfish and you've totally ignored me and I haven't been a priority in your life, you have made no eternal investments. And everything you have, I'm now going to take back because it's mine anyway and you've got nothing to show for your entire life. How sad is that? And I know this parable may seem a little harsh, but Jesus is trying to wake us up to something here. He's trying to wake us up to the fact that if God is not our top priority in life, and that includes our finances, we're going to waste what he's given us. And I believe that's why God in the Old Testament instituted the biblical principle of the tithe. If you're new to church or the church setting, you may not have heard this word before, maybe you have, but the word tithe just simply means a tenth or 10%. And in the Old Testament, God taught his people that when you make money, when you bring in your paycheck, when you harvest your crops, whatever that looks like, when you make any type of money or have any type of resources, the first 10%, the first tenth, is to be set aside for God. It belongs to him. In fact, Leviticus 27 verse 30 says, A tithe of everything from the land, whether grain from the soil or fruit from the trees, belongs to who? The Lord. It is holy to the Lord. And this is God's financial plan for our lives. So let me spell it out like this. Let me explain it like this. Let's say that you have 10 $1 bills. I thought about bringing up here 10 $100 bills, but I'm a preacher. So we have 10 $1 bills. It's a joke, but kind of. But I, we have 10 $1 bills. And this is what God says. God says that when you... Get your pay. The first 10%, the first tenth, is to be set aside for me, given to me. And then we teach here at First Church, the Bible also tells us that we are to save money so that we can get out of debt and not be a slave to the lender. So we teach that you should take the next 10%, the next tenth, and put it into savings, either for a rainy day fund or, like I said, to get out of debt or something like that. And then the Bible says the last 80%, the last $8 you have, that can go into the bowl of your life. And you can use it in order to live life. Now, this still isn't yours. It still ultimately belongs to God. But you can use it to live life. 
And so what that means is you can take the rest of the money that you make and use it for what you need to use it for in a God-honoring way. So you can pay your house payment, you can pay the rest of your bills, you can buy your kids new clo uh, clothes and shoes, you can take your spouse out for dinner, you can go see a movie if you want to, you can buy that new lawnmower that you need, you can take up a hobby, you can take your preacher out to lunch, you know, whatever you want to do. You can use this 80% for whatever you need to use it on in a God-honoring way. And this is God's plan right here for your life. This is a healthy financial life, God says. And if you do this in this sequence, God will honor it. Now again, he's not promising that you will be independently wealthy, but you will live a stable, healthy, full life when it comes to your finances. This will be a God-honoring system. This is a God-honoring system. But that's not how we often live. Most of the time what we do is we get our pay and we just put it all in the same bowl. And we say, you know, I will give to God eventually. Maybe when I got some stuff left over, I'll give to God. And so when that dollar drive comes up or that special need comes up, I'll give to God. And then that time comes and guess what? We've already spent it over here, right? And we don't have it. Guys, if you don't follow this sequence and put God first, you know what's gonna happen? I guarantee you, you will end up robbing God. You will not give him a tithe. If you put it all over here, you will not give it to him. And that's why God says the first tenth, the first 10% is to be set aside especially for me. Now let me ask, does God need this 10%? Of course not. Everything's his anyway. He doesn't need this 10% in order to exist. You know, he doesn't need this money in order to do ministry. He could find another way. He is God. And by the way, he could take everything from you right now if he wanted to. That's what he did for the man in the parable, right? He doesn't need this 10%. But why does he say at the very beginning before you spend any of your pay, give me 10%? Because he knows it's a sign that he is your top priority. Because if you will put him first in your finances, you will set aside that tenth before you spend anything else. If you will put him first in your finances, you will put him first in every other area of life as well. It's a sign that you are committed to him. It's a sign up front that he is your top priority. So you give 10 to him, 10 to savings, and then 80 to live life. And for those of you who have or who do tithe, and maybe one time you didn't, I'm sure you will be the first to say, I don't even miss this. In fact, God has continued to bless me even more since I've started living out his plan for my finances and my resources. It is Father's Day, and one thing that my dad taught me from a very young age is to tithe. And I remember if I got allowance money or birthday money from grandparents or anything, my dad taught me to tithe. I was to give 10% to the church. And so I did that. I did that from a very young age. And my dad taught me the importance of it because he saw it work in his life. And there were some times during my parents' early marriage and whatever that things were really tight, that they struggled a lot. And my dad said, we always tithe. Whether we had a little or a lot, we always tithe. And he said, no matter what, God took care of us over and over, and God took care of us. Now my parents, they live a comfortable life. They're not extremely wealthy or anything like that, but they live a comfortable, stable life. And my dad attributes that to throughout their marriage, throughout their life, him continuing to tithe because God honors that. And let me just say, from personal experience, I've seen that happen too. My dad taught me from a young age to tithe, but there have been seasons in my life when I didn't for whatever reason. And most of my life I have, but there have been seasons when I haven't. And when I haven't, my life has been a mess, not just financially, but in other ways too. I've seen the reverse effect. And I guarantee you there are dozens of people in our church that could tell you a similar story because God honors this path. God honors this system, this way of life because it shows that you're putting him first. He will take care of you. But the man in our parable, the parable that Jesus tells in Luke chapter 12, God was definitely not a priority. It wasn't just that he wasn't a priority. He wasn't even, God wasn't even an afterthought for him. And he believed that the more money he saved up for himself, the happier he would be. And a lot of people today still believe that. And that brings us to the next lie that Jesus exposes. Lie number three, more money will make me happier. People honestly believe this. Now, I think most of us, again, know this isn't true. But deep down, we think, you know, but if I just had that extra money, 
If I just had that better job, if I just had the fancier car, if I just had that boat, that house, then I'd be a little bit happier. We, we know it's not true in our heads, but again, we don't always live like that. But Ecclesiastes 5 verse 10 says this, Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. And isn't that true? How many of us have known people who have stored up for themselves all this treasure, all this stuff, all this money, and they are absolutely miserable? And you think, boy, but if I had that money, I wouldn't be miserable. We say that. And yet that doesn't tend to be the case. I found a quote the other day by Jim Carrey, you know, the actor. And he says, I think everybody should get rich and famous and do everything they ever dreamed of so they can see that it's not the answer. And I could give you countless quotes today by famous people, movie stars, wealthy people who had everything their heart desired and yet they were still unhappy. They were still miserable. They still felt as if they were missing something. See, the real question isn't, what if I got everything I ever wanted? The real question we should be asking is, then what? If we did get everything we ever wanted, then what? When my bigger barns are full, and I build even bigger barns, and they get full, then what? Because in a split second, like the man in our parable, those barns could be gone. Then what? You see, the only thing that lasts is our relationship with God. Don't invest your entire life in temporary things that will be gone one day. Invest in what eternally matters. Your life isn't defined by what you own but it's defined by the relationship you have with the one who owns everything. And since this guy in our parable left God out of the equation, he believed that he could do whatever he wanted with his money. And that leads us to the last lie that I believe Jesus exposes. And it kind of builds off lie number two and says, it's my money. Well, this last lie is, since it is my money, since it is my stuff, I can do with it what I want. It's my stuff. I can do with it what I want to do with it. And because this man had that attitude, his heart wasn't in sync with God's heart. See, back in Deuteronomy chapter 24, God gives this command. Listen very carefully to what he says to his people. Verse 19, when you are harvesting your crops and forget to bring in a bundle of grain from your field, don't go back to get it. Leave it for the foreigners, the orphans, the widows, the less fortunate, in other words. Then the Lord, your God, will bless you in all you do. And then he goes on to give other examples about, hey, if you're picking grapes, you're doing other things, leave some behind for the less fortunate to come and get. And listen to what he says in verse 22. Remember that you were slaves in the land of Egypt. That is why I'm giving you this command. In other words, God's telling his people, since I have taken care of you, you need to take care of others. That's why God has given you everything you have to show his love to others. Whether you have a whole lot or a little, you can do something with what God has given you to show his love to someone else. Proverbs 11 verse 25 says, a generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others will be refreshed. See, our world is fixated on getting, but we as followers of Jesus need to be fixated on giving. Rather than finding our identity in what we get, we should find our identity in what we give. And that's why Jesus includes the parable by saying in verse 21, this is how it will be with anyone who stores up things for himself but is not rich toward God. A while back I was talking to a friend of mine who's in ministry and he was telling me about a day that he was preaching a sermon and he was trying to motivate people to give to a special fund that they were starting because they wanted to collect some extra funds in their church to do some additional ministry that they weren't doing at that time and so they were trying to explain that to everybody and they wanted to raise a certain goal so they go in and do this extra ministry and as he's going through and explaining this there was a little girl sitting in church that morning who was just excited about what the church wanted to do in order to help people and so she shouted out loud in the middle of the sermon, I'm going to give you everything in my piggy bank. And people sitting around this little girl just kind of snickered and laughed. Some people said, oh, that's sweet. And sure enough, that week, that little girl came to the church office and gave everything in her piggy bank to the church so that they could help other people. They could show other people the love of God. 
And so that next week, the preacher stood back up, this friend of mine, and he told that story again. Of course, they have multiple services, so uh, some people didn't know that the little girl had done that. And so he explained what the little girl had done and brought in the money that week. And after he finished telling the story again, as kind of a motivational story, you know, to get people to buy into what their church was trying to do to help people and show love to people, this old gentleman walked up to him after services, and he said, listen, I know that little girl who shouted that out. I know her parents. And the reason why she's able to say, I'll give you everything in my piggy bank is because she doesn't have to worry about anything. She doesn't own the house that she lives in. Her parents do, and her parents pay the bills. Her parents give her food. Her parents provide for her. Her parents take care of her, and her parents are always going to do that. She's able to give everything she has because she's got parents who look out for her. And that preacher friend of mine looked back at that older gentleman and he said, yeah, and so do you. You have a heavenly father who loves you dearly and nothing you have is yours. That house you live in, it's his. That food you eat belongs to him. That car you drive, it's his. This world we live in, the earth we walk on, it's his. And you don't have to give everything you have to him. But does your generosity show how much you trust him, really? Because when you trust that God will take care of you, when you trust that he will look after you, when you trust that he will provide for you, you will be more and more generous when it comes to unleashing his love on others. Guys, I just want to let you know today, we have a heavenly father who is in control of all things. You are not in control. I am not in control. We have a father who is over all things, and this entire earth belongs to him. How much do you trust him? Because when you trust him, you'll follow his plan. Because you know he knows what's best for you. And no matter what, he's going to take care of you because he loves you, and you are his child. Guys, if you want what normal people have financially, then do what normal people do. But if you want what a few people have financially, then do what a few people do. Follow God's plan for your life. Would you pray with me? Father, we thank you for this time we've had to open up your word and study it. And Father, we thank you for giving us a plan. You could have just left us on our own and said, hey, figure it out, but you didn't. You gave us a solid plan. And we just pray that as a church, we can follow that. It's going to be challenging at first for some, but we know that you honor a life that aligns its resources with your priorities. And so I pray that everybody in this room commits to doing just that in every area of their lives, and especially when it comes to their finances. Father, you don't need our 10%. You don't need anything from us. But Father, may we show through what we have that we love you, and that you are our top priority. Thank you so much for giving us a chance to live the abundant life. And we just pray that we can live the life that your son has brought us every single day and unleash it on others. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Amen.